Hello, Steve from Steve's Makerspace. We are in P5JS, and I'm going to talk about watercolor texture or watercolor effect in P5JS. So I'll show you how to get an effect like this or this. I also have this little app you can play with. It's basically like spray painting. I'll talk about the code for this. I also have a paper texture, which is kind of hard to see, but but here I've just added paper texture. Now I'll take the paper texture out. Now here's without the paper texture and here's with the paper texture again. It's kind of subtle, but I think it really makes the end product uh, look a lot nicer. And then I'll go over briefly how to put that watercolor effect inside of a shape so it has a nice tight boundary. And this is all leading up to my newest art project, which is this, which uses this watercolor effect. And it can do things like this, and this, and this. But I won't be going over the code for this. It's a complicated project. I'm just going to talk about the watercoloring effects. Barney Codes did his own watercolor effect just a few days ago. I encourage you to check out his channel. He's got a lot of great stuff. And this is a video on a watercolor app that I did a while ago that uses a completely different process. I'll leave a link to that. You can go check that out. But the process that I'm mostly using is from this algorithmic art. So I've taken the basics of his process and done some more stuff with it. I'll leave a link to this video as well. So to begin with, let's talk about making a circle. Obviously, P5JS makes it easy to make a circle, but how do you make a circle with points or with a vertex? You would have to go through all of the angles of the circle from 0 all the way to pi times 2, which is 360 degrees around. And then for each of those angles, you would calculate where the x and y is from the center of that circle using cosine and sine times the radius of the circle. So here I've got a circle with radius of 200. And if I click on the middle of the canvas, I'm drawing a circle. So it starts at 0, goes around to 360 degrees, and it's incrementing by 0.1. Now, I can increment this by 1 instead of 0.1. And now when I click here, it's still sort of drawing a circle, except it's just got fewer points. I can draw over here and draw over here, and you can see it's making the exact same shape. Now I've got the color changing slightly with each drawing. This time, let's make the radius random. And I've also made the radius a lot smaller. So I'll draw over here, and I'll draw here, and here, and here. And you can see I'm getting different shapes. Now let's add some rotation to this. We're currently translating to the XY position. Uh, now we're going to add some rotation. So click here, like so. This is at full alpha. If I come back over here and we put this back down to say 6, now I can click here and you can see I've got basically a watercolor effect. Now I've also got a loop here Instead of doing just one uh, vertex drawing every time I click on the canvas, let's draw three of them. And so I'll click here, and now we can do like this. And I've got this color picker here. So the color picker is create color picker, color picker position, and then we get the color from the color picker. So we'll change that, and like so. So we have our watercolor or paintbrush effect. I've also got here, if mouse is pressed equals true, then we're filling. Uh, notice also that the color is changing slightly. Uh, it's filling with a color that's a little bit off. So here's my red value, and this is the color from the color picker for the red value. And then I'm adding to that random negative 25, positive 25. So it could be if the red was 200, I might be getting 175, or I might be getting 225, or anywhere in between. And I do the same thing for the green and the blue. So that's pretty much it. Draw a wonky circle slash star, rotate it, give it a bunch of alpha, and draw a whole bunch of them. Links to all the examples I'm going to be talking about will be in the video description. So let's talk about this now. So this part way at the bottom of this code is exactly the same as what I just showed you. The thing I'm doing differently here is instead of me drawing on the canvas, I'm allowing the computer to draw on the canvas. It's going on a random walk and just drawing all over the canvas. 
And I've also got two different random walks happening with two different colors. Let me get rid of the second random walk and I'll hit go a few times and you'll see a more consistent color. Not quite as a complex of a canvas. That one's a little complex. So I still have the color varying as it goes on the random walk. And this is using HSB mode instead of RGB. So I've got a variable here for maximum variance of 20. Uh, I'm going to get a color. I'm going to get a hue between 0 and 360. I've got my saturation starting at 90. The maximum saturation is going to be 100 and the minimum is 40. Brightness is starting at 70 and the maximum brightness is 70 and the minimum brightness is 30. Then where I'm going to start my random walk, uh, random width, random height is going to be I and J. That's all in the get color function, although a lot of this could have been up at the top. So then back up to the setup section, we've got the color. Now we're going to calculate a number of drawings that we're going to be needing to make in order to fill the background. So this is going to be based on the width times the height, and I'm dividing by 25 to come up with some number. So in this case, I've got a 500 by 500 canvas. That's 250,000 pixels. Divide by 25, I'm going to do 10,000 drawings. And before I go for my random walk, I'm going to fill the background. If I don't fill the background, there might be some gaps. So I'll take the background out and you see some white space here. I'll hit start a few times and you see there's some white because the random walk might not fill everything. So first we'll put in a background and then we'll call the fill background function. So let's go there. So I've got a loop here between zero and the number that I calculated up above. That was 25,000. Now my I and my J, basically my X and my Y, are going to go on a random walk. They're moving randomly by this move function, which is, that's 50. So it's moving 50 spaces each time. And then my hue, saturation, and brightness are also going on a random walk. They're being changed by a value of 2 each time. The hue, the saturation, and the brightness. Although I could, let's change these and we'll make it double. There we go. Now we get a little bit more variation in the saturation and the brightness. But, and then I have a bunch of if statements that are basically keeping everything in bounds. The width, if it goes all the way to the right, it wraps around to the beginning and the height, same thing. The hue is gonna be capped at the maximum hue that I calculated before and the same thing with the minimum hue except that the maximum hue might actually be more than 360. I've done that on purpose because here I'm going to be subtracting 360 if the number that's calculated is over 360. And the same thing with the zero. If it's less than zero, then I'm going to be adding 360 to that number to get my final hue. The saturation and the brightness boundaries are more straightforward. If it goes over the maximum saturation, then it just equals the maximum saturation. After doing all of that, then I fill with my final hue, saturation, and brightness, and the alpha. And then I do that wonky star that I talked about before. So that's if we go on one random walk. For the second random walk, I'm going to get a second color. And the number of drawings I'm going to do are a lot less. I'm going to do one-tenth of the number of drawings. So let me uncomment this. And then I'm just going to call the fill background. So we'll hit play a few more times. And you can see that I get something like this with two different colors. The first color has a background and then is drawn a lot. The second color, I don't do a background. And I only draw one-tenth of the previous color. And then finally, there's this blur that I'm adding at the end. If I take the blur out, it still looks nice, but you can see a bit of definition from where the wonky stars were drawn. I'll hit play again so you can see that. It's not bad, really, but if I add a little bit of blur to it, then it gets rid of some of that definition. So I've got 0 0.5. If I were to add a blur of 4, you'd see something like this but I just want to get rid of a little bit of that definition, so I do 0.5 blur. Now, the paper texture is next. 
So this is kind of subtle to see. So I'm going to change some of the variables so it'll be easier to see. Okay, I've done that. And this is what I'm drawing for the paper texture. It's just some curves and some points. And here's the curve. And you can see this is 0, 0.00 because I've translated to an XY position. And the colors are hovering in a gray position between 100 and 150 for the R, the G, and the B. Let's take out the rotation. And you can see now they're all moving in the same direction. Let's also take out the translating, or actually let's translate instead of to a random XY position, let's just translate to the middle of the canvas. And you can see that this is what's actually happening. Let's uh, only do one of these. There, so each time I'll hit play, and you'll see a different curve being drawn and a different point. And that is basically all it's doing over and over again. Now the curve, uh, there's nothing really special about these numbers. I just played around with this until I got a curve that I thought looked interesting. I wanted it to be a certain length and just to have a certain curve to it. Let's put the rotation back in and let's do 10 texture numbers. I'll hit go a few times. Now for the number of textures, I'm doing width times height divided by 30. So let's go ahead and put that back. And now we've got a whole bunch being drawn, but let's get the X and Y back to what it was. We'll translate to a random X, Y position. And now we'll put our stroke weight back to three. Uh, oh, that was for the point. Let's put the stroke weight for the line back to one. And finally, we'll put the alpha down to six. And there we go, there's our paper texture. It looks pretty subtle. Uh, I can up it to maybe 16 and you can see a really strong paper texture. Let's go back to the background, and there's paper texture you can add either in the beginning or in the end. So first I'll do the paper texture after I do the background fill. I'll uncomment this. Let me go ahead and put in a random seed so we can see the difference. So here's with the paper texture. Oops, here's without the paper texture. I am getting a different color uh, even though I have a random seed because the paper texture takes some time. So the random seed thing isn't working really. But this is without the paper texture. This is with the paper texture at the beginning. This is the paper texture at the end. Here it is without. Here it is with the paper texture. So that's how that works. You can try it uh, before the watercolor effect or you can try it at the end. Finally, I'll say a little bit about how I'm doing this. I did do a whole video on clipping masks, which is what this is. Uh, so I'll leave a link to that video in the video description. I go over this in more detail there. But very quickly, I am creating an invisible canvas for each of these circles that are being drawn. Then whatever I call the canvas, in this case CNV, I have to put CNV dot in front of everything having to do with that canvas. And then I have to add this thing, canvas.getContext2D, uh, in order to do this clipping later on. This is not part of the P5 library, this is native to JavaScript. So I've got a circle being drawn before I do this clip function, and then everything that happens after the clip function is going to go within that circle, and it won't go outside of the bounds of that circle. So I had my paper texture, I get a color, I do all my watercolor stuff. So the width of the circle I've got in this variable, WID, uh, so that's the diameter of the circle. The canvas, the invisible canvas itself is actually a little bit bigger than that. So I've got, when I created the canvas, I'm doing 1.1 times that diameter of that circle. And that is because I want the outline of that circle that was my dog. I'll just take this out so you can see what that looks like. There we go. And you can see right here that the edge is missing. So we'll just multiply by 1.1 for each of these and that will make sure that the edge doesn't disappear. Then when I draw my circle, I'm drawing it in the middle of the invisible canvas. Now at the very end, I redraw the circle with a nice stroke weight and no fill just to make sure it's got a nice clean edge. And then once I've done all that, 
uh, all, none of this is on my canvas yet. It's on the invisible canvas. Now I can place that invisible canvas onto my canvas at a random location. So that is how that works. And that is the basis for how I did this effect. I will talk about this art project in a future video. But that's going to do it for today. If you've liked this video, please give it a like. Consider subscribing to the channel. Ring the bell for notifications. Uh, comments are always welcome. Look at the, for the links in the video description. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye now. Steve's Makerspace.